Who are we scared of this week? Is it migrants or labor shortages? Brussels or Moscow? Maybe Beijing? Trans women or the crackdown on women's rights? Whatever your taste and fear, we have a wide variety of blends on offer. Introducing populist politics for hardcore users. We also have the actually scary stuff like genocide and military volatility in the Middle East, the bombardment of Ukraine, the Europe-wide housing crisis and climate change. Fear not, we'll help you fearmonger like a pro. Who needs solutions when you can market salvation instead? Tap into societal fears today! What the hell is border securitization and why is this all the rage in Europe right now? The military warfare um, and the migration issue gets connected in a bad way. Now technology is foreseen like the perfect solution in order to manage with these security issues. This kind of uh, political communication, integrate now, is not terribly useful. Here I'm not seen as an individual person. Um, I have a label, I'm a migrant, so I speak for a whole group. But why do I have to uh, be the person who talks about a whole group? Welcome to Standard Time, a Eurozine production. This is a talk show with guests from all over Europe discussing Europe, and today we talk about a big one on continental minds, security. I'm Reka Kingapop, editor-in-chief of Said Eurozine, the magazine presenting this show in co-production with OctoTV in Austria. Eurozine is also a co-founder of the Display Europe platform, offering you content in 15 European languages on culture, politics, community and so much more. Since this is a digital production, you get to watch it on your own time, your respective standard time. I say watch it, but we also started to publish our episodes in a podcast format and you can find them both on displayeurope.eu. Just look for Standard Time Talk Show, or you can also find it on any podcast app or your usual video platforms. Security is on everybody's minds and at the top of the political agenda across Europe. But if we are to delve into this question, we have to address a paradox at the root of it. While the EU is very invested in fortifying its borders against irregular migrants, it has never had and had never been intended to have a military force of its own. Historically, this makes sense. This alliance was meant to bring European countries together in peace, which in itself is a historical feat and on a continent that fought wars as a favorite pastime for the past few thousand years. In order to entice and appease otherwise rivaling member states into allying with each other, it has been a cornerstone of the European project to guarantee great sovereignty to its members, including in military questions. Many European countries have long relied on NATO for their security since the Second World War. This even includes non-member countries by proxy, since being surrounded by members of a transnational force definitely has huge perks looking at you, Austria. Yet this mellow approach to sincere military threats is contrasted by the EU's ever-firming attitude toward irregular migration. This includes the hundreds of thousands of people trying to enter the European Union every year from Africa, the Middle East or Asia, seeking refuge from wars, famine, economic and political instability, and yeah, persecution. The European Union likes to promote its devotion to human rights, but you won't need a magnifying glass to see that this agenda falls very short when it comes to border regimes, migration, and especially non-European refugees. Instead, the EU focuses on securitization and deterrence measures, which undermine its promoted values of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. And the joint policy has just become even more morose. The European Parliament's recent adoption of the Migration and Asylum Pact on April the 10th was certainly a strategic move, but what does it entail and who's paying the price for the votes? Among the reforms listed in the pact are the quicker examination of asylum procedures, mandatory security and health checks for people irregularly entering the EU, and a new voluntary scheme to resettle refugees coming from third world countries. These reforms have been met with protests from activists and NGOs who claim that the package undermines human rights. Asylum seekers will risk detainment, deportation, increased racial profiling, and are guaranteed no legal representation. 
In a nutshell, the EU keeps finding ways to outsource responsibility. Its reliance on external actors such as Turkey and Libya has raised legitimate concerns about its complicity in human rights abuses and violations. You can read more on this from researchers on the ground in Eurozine's article series, Elastic Borders. In the realm of foreign policy, the EU faces significant challenges in asserting its influence and promoting its interests on the global stage. The Union's response to crises in its neighborhoods, such as the wars in Ukraine and Syria, have lacked coherence, and the EU's relations with major powers like the US, China and Russia are fraught with tensions and uncertainties. So far, there has been an ineffectiveness in addressing the root causes of the increase in forced migration, including climate change, systemic racism, and gender-based discrimination and violence. So let's try to address these questions first with our guests. Sedra Arab received her BA in Transcultural Communication from the Karl Francis University of Graz and is currently doing an MA in Social Work at the University of Applied Sciences in Vienna. She is an Arabic-German translator, anti-racism trainer, and workshop facilitator at Azul Koordination Austria. She is part of ENAR, the European Network Against Racism, documenting cases of anti-Muslim racism with Dokustelle. Her work centers community approaches to prevent gender-based violence. Gustavo de la Orden Bosch is an associate researcher at the Pedro Arrupta Institute of Human Rights at the University of Deusto in Spain, and is currently doing his fellowship at the University of Graz. His research addresses border studies, migration, asylum, criminalization, and human rights from the perspective of international law, criminal law, and criminology. His project aims to better understand the European Union's border regime, both inside and outside of the Schengen area. Philippe Thea is a professor of Central European History at the University of Vienna, and he is also the founder of RISED, the Research Center for the History of Transformations at Univin. He has published and co-edited several books and articles that have been translated into 15 European languages. In 2019, he was awarded the Wittgenstein Prize of the Austrian Research Fund. His main research areas include comparative nationalism studies and social and cultural history, with his most recent works covering the history of refugees in modern Europe. Hello and welcome. I would like you all to help us decipher this paradox between the fact that the EU doesn't have its own military, and yet borders are being more and more fortified. What the hell is border securitization and why is this all the rage in Europe right now? Uh, migration since the very beginning of the 21st century has been securitized, so perceive it as a security issue. The problem here is that we are forgetting all the, um, the human side of migration, so uh, there, there are many gaps in the migration policy by the European Union in this sense. We have mentioned the Migration and Asylum Pact and there's a lot of problems with it. Can you just walk us through very quickly what this most recent policy pact entails? After the asylum seekers gave their claims, they either will be deported to safe third country or relocated to another EU member state uh, in a detention center and to be sent to where they come from originally. We have a lot of research and people who are being deported also are facing imprisonment. And then we have another problem is with these new regulations, uh, people are being under severe civ civilians, for example, biometric uh, identification, which is problematic because if we know from the history, this is exactly where a racial element is inside because some specific group of people who are targeted, like specific nationalities that are facing this problem, pushbacks and deportation will just become easy, easier than, than already is now. Philip, you've researched the hell out of the history of migration in Europe. The research institute you founded, RESET, also does a lot of work in this field, including racial profiling, 
among Europeans, non-Europeans, etc. So for somebody born yesterday, has there ever been anything else than securitization that we can imagine? Um, I think the EU might be in a bad situation because on the one hand it tries to assume competences, on the other hand it is not a state. If the nation states can't regulate things, then the EU is called in, and then if the EU then fails, um, then again, okay, one can blame Brussels. In the past 50 years, since the closure of uh, industrialized countries for guest workers or post-colonial migrants, but for all sorts of labor migrants, it is basically very difficult to enter. Through the closure of um, legal labor migration, which we need, obviously, uh, this adds pressure on uh, the whole asylum system, where it shouldn't be. So also, it's very difficult to help the people who need help because it also produces this misperception of migration as being a threat. It's based on a social uh, selection, basically, right? It's the educated ones, the more um, affluent ones who can afford to flee. If that is always happening, that's not so good for the for the sending societies, and um, we are now in a different situation. So, okay, there's migration, which by itself. On one level, speaking military, uh, we indeed need a securitization. If you looked at what uh, Lukashenko did at the Belarusian-Polish border, phew, this is weaponizing, um, this was a, a sort of war against the EU, uh, abusing migrants from the Middle East. And this was an attempt to destabilize the EU. So then suddenly, you know, the military warfare um, and the migration issue gets connected in a bad way. We have talked about, in a previous episode, about the very special treatment that Ukrainian refugees got in the EU. One of the big takeaways from the discussion was that it was a special treatment because the bar was incredibly low. This is not a, a very sort of rich and very well-endowed reception. It is very rich compared to what, say, non-Europeans have gotten. The issue of technology and border technology, which came up very much. There's a huge investment in border technologies. There seems to be a divestment from the human services and support. As migration is perceived as a security threat, now technology is foreseen like the perfect solution in order to manage with these security issues. Technologies and smart borders could simplify many of the procedures that are taking place at the borders. Those kind of technologies are just aimed at surveillance. I mean, it's just in order to prevent anyone to reach the European borders. There's a gap on protection, mainly because Every person is labeled as a, as a migrant, as an irregular migrant. This person could be in a situation of need, of need of protection. I think this is one of the main problems of uh, EU migration and asylum policies that are so uh, embedded with security, but only security of the state and security of the territory and not on security of human life. So a state usually use this argument of security in order to justify many restrictions on uh, human rights. So we need to clarify where the, the, the priorities are. You mentioned, for instance, labor migration, which is so often used in discussion as this uh, negative sort of abuse of the system, whereas labor migration, and I'm saying this as a labor migrant myself, from Hungary to Austria, uh, we use the welfare system less than those who are permanent residents here or who, who were born here. Labor migrants tend to cost less. Intra-European and extra-European racism underneath it, it's always about otherness. We talk about integration oftentimes in these situations. So the sort of wariness that these people come here and they're gonna change our culture, which is changing anyway. Migrants, asylum seekers, are always the vulnerable, the, the most vulnerable and marginalized group in Europe. So they're also they're always targeted. And the problem is, uh, when we talk about them, there's not just an impact on their life, but also the impact on other migrations, like labor mi migrants. We tend to think that migration is only a problem of migrants. Such racist policies I would say affect all of us, and and integration is two ways. The problem is with my with integration; it's a never-ending steps. 
We have structural racism, we need to address that. We have racial profiling, we have to address that. I completely agree with you that this kind of uh, political communication, integrate now, is not terribly useful. It's a two-sided process. If you want to know more about European news and affairs and see what the Display Europe portal has to offer, check out Vox Europe's press review articles and short video recaps. What hides behind the newly uncovered Russian influence campaign known as the Voice of Europe? Pavel Bartoshek reviews the situation in partnership with Display Europe, European politicians on Putin's payroll. Russians attempted to influence European elections from Prague, titles Czech Daily, Denik N. The media, who first flagged the campaign, describes it as one of the most significant Russian influence operations uncovered in recent years. Display Europe's newsletters provide information and updates about DisplayEurope.eu, a groundbreaking media platform anchored in public values, built by independent not-for-profit media organizations from across Europe. You know, we're talking about cultural exchange and we're talking about culture as it changes and societal attitudes to receiving things. I think what I find very peculiar is that we are in a moment when um, at least European culture is globalizing at an incredible pace and we are losing a lot of cultural roots not due to migration, it's due to mass media and the, the globalization of both politics and communication. And we're blaming uh, in migration for people for bringing their traditional cultures or and you know any kind of cultures in here, which they also are desperate to hold on to, quite like everyone else. So, um, Philip, you already have a couple of comments lined up there. I think, please take it away. I don't have to disturb you with a question. Now, I had uh, the luck to grow up in Turkey for a number of years. And of course, we also, you know, as a family, uh, I mean, we're visibly non-Turkish, blonde hair. Uh, also, there are some Turks who have blonde hair. But, um, but anyway, it, it, we also took some steps of uh, integrating, like, you know, the kind we dressed, um, especially my sister, uh, in which places we moved, what we kind of respected. Um, so I think this is indeed um, a two-sided process. Um, so sometimes I'm wondering, you know, if you want to remain all the same, then maybe it's not a good idea to move to another country. Um, you won't be very, very happy there. You know, when you ask, hmm, what do I receive? Well, still quite a lot, I would say, and not only racism. You know, decent, at least in Austria, decent public schools, fair treatment at workplace, maybe even, you know, uh, collective wage agreements, so a decent salary. This is tricky, but anyway, I agree with you, you know, yelling at them, integrate now, and seeing it as a one-sided process. And this is maybe indeed a cultural issue. We could be more hospitable. Yes, there is some kind of access for us migrants here, like access to school, uh, access to... Uh, public health, but not for all of us. I can give an example when you are an asylum seeker and you're still in the procedure and you, you don't know if you're staying or not. For some, for some people, this also takes five years. And in these five years, if you're, for example, 16, the school doesn't have to take you because you're, you're older than 15. When we talk about violence or gender equality, this is not a cultural thing. Patriarchy is everywhere. It's an oppression system. We see it, we feel it as women. This security situation, I don't like it. But um, I guess the borders, you know, Eastern Polish border or Lithuanian, they must be fortified. They shouldn't be, uh, they shouldn't be, it shouldn't be impossible to cross them with tanks. If we agree that, you know, this asylum system is crooked, right? The people taking huge efforts, huge amount of money, very unequal gender wealth distribution among the refugees. If we accept also that this is crooked, then there is also an alternative, and this is the United Nations resettlement schemes, um, UNHCR. It's all there. So I wouldn't only point to the asylum issue, but uh, interna international refugee policy has always had this um, resettlement component. Integration and racism should, shouldn't be in the same place. Uh, if we are talking about integration, that's a huge issue to deal with. And then 
if we have um, any racist discourses or policies, this is not about integration or disintegration, this is about discrimination and that's all I mean and we need to eradicate this kind of discourses or feelings that are then like fooled mainly by radical right-wing parties. On the other hand, about the, the, the borders and the need of security at the borders, I do agree with you in the sense that uh, every state is sovereign and has the, the, the duty or, and also the right to protect the borders. When we talk about the, the borders and the, the security issues there, for example, uh, all the, the, the transnational crimes that could take place also in, in detriment of human rights, such as, for example, um, human trafficking or, on another hand, for example, money laundering. And I think the, the problem here is not about like the, um, the security management, but previously the externalization of all these migration policies. The EU in this, in this regard is the one like uh, threatening the position of these third neighbor countries that then use migration as a weapon. And the, the EU pact in this regard, for example, one of its regulations, the one on crisis and force major um, situations, dealing with this kind of instrumentalization of migration situations, in a very bad way, let's say, because it's diminishing the rights of migrant people by, for example, uh, speeding up all the procedures just in order to expel them. You talked about how out-migration from the sending countries is much bigger an issue. And what we're talking about within Europe and mostly the EU is the crisis of the welfare state. The welfare state is a relatively short uh, or, or like relatively young concept, historically speaking. And um, it started to be cut down or le already in its early decades. What do you expect in this respect? Is the welfare state going to, um, going to hemorrhage further? Is there a turning point there? How does this play into the whole issue of migration? Yes, and the expectation was that that would eventually even out in kind of an equilibrium, right? <laughs> taken from... What a nice idea. Uh, taken from <laughs> that, you know, eventually the out-migration of so many people would lead to a rising demand for labor and then wages would rise. Uh, the demand is rising, the wages are rising very little. At least in exploitative right-wing populist regimes like in Hungary, so poor Hungarians. In Poland, by the way, it's, it, it's a dead end also for Hungary itself because then the wages can rise as they should. I'm wondering about the investors, why they are going. Treated in a way that they are chased out, like CEO, after all, this was also a medium-sized enterprise. Or most recently, uh, Spar, the, yeah. the supermarket chain being threatened sort oh, of yes. in, in very particular ways, yeah. so attempting to buy them out. And it's not the first case. No, 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 it is, it is really a good investment uh, strategy. And this is creating a downward spiral because after all, then the states don't have the revenue to pay for welfare. Let me introduce you to the work of our friend and colleague Claire Potter, a professor of history emeritus at the New School of Social Research and the co-executive editor of Public Seminar, one of Eurozine's partner journals. Her blog, Political Junkie, and podcast, Why Now?, are available to read and listen to on Substack, and she's fantastic. Find her under clairepotter.substack.com. Hi, Claire. There is a violation of data protection also here. And we, all, we know, like for example, that we, data protection was in the last years really important for, for, for Europe. Um, especially in Austria, now like data protection is like number one. Oh, uh, for those who don't know, in Vienna, people took, or certain houses took the names off of the intercoms because this felt like a violation of data protection. So they took GDPR very seriously. This leads us also to the question of, okay, fundamental rights, human rights, for who? When I come as a migrant, here I'm not seen as an individual person. Um, I have a label. I'm a migrant, so I speak for a whole group. 
but why do I have to uh, be the person who talks about a whole group? I am an individual person. I am here. I want to work. And when we talk about welfare system, like you said at the beginning, like there's also studies in Austria, the people who are depending on the system are actually more Europeans than the labor migrants or the migrants that are coming here. I think it's important to point out, and you have a very direct experience in this, that, um, that specifically Muslims and Arabs have been othered in European, or I should say Western European uh, mainstream discourse for hundreds of years. You document anti-Muslim racism. Tell us about this. How do we imagine this? Uh, we monitor social media a lot, like, uh, like especially Facebook, YouTube, uh, Instagram and TikTok. We document also political speeches. I would say problematic political point of views where they racialize Muslim Muslims. We're doing advocacy work. We go to schools, we do workshops, we go to civil society organization, we do community work. We try to reach the communities, Muslim communities and non-Muslim communities. Anti-Muslim racism doesn't only, only happen against Muslim, but like also people who as, are perceived as Muslims. Maybe it's kind of beating the same old drum, but it's so important to point out that Islam has been a part of European history and culture forever since its inception. Going through like Western style European education system, we learn very little about both Islam or Arabs, or even I would say like any of the wider regional history. So as a, a sort of transcultural communication uh, and anti-racism trainer, what, what's your method to, to start? I mean, one of, one of the methods is like we connect with teachers, we connect also with policy makers, we try, we try our best. We need new curriculums. We have to have an anti-colonial history inside. We have to, you know, people have to learn also about, like you said, other cultures, different cultures actually, not other cultures. One of the things that now we're recently doing is we're doing like something is called uh, train the trainer. We train people so they can train or like they, so they can know how to start to talk inside of their communities. We also do sometimes like a chain workshops. Not only us migrants or POC needs to work on as affected people, no, it's actually an issue that benefits all the society. Giving some context about the EU pact on migration and asylum, and I think like the, also the interaction with the security policies of the European Union, I mean, since the beginning of the 21st century, there's like this merge between migration borders and security issues. The EU pact in this sense is like the latest uh, attempt by the European Commission in order to overcome all the shortcomings that have been evidenced since then, since the beginning of the 21st century, but mainly uh, after uh, 2015, since the, the so-called refugee crisis. Looking at this from the perspective of the elections of the European Parliament, uh, we can say that the, the European centrist parties have presented the, the approval, the adoption of the pact as a triumph for the European Union. It was resisted by far-right parties. We can say that nobody is happy with the pact. And also all those countries that are uh, posing anti-migration uh, policies and discourses, such as the case of Hungary and Poland, they, they were totally reluctant to the pact. There's a still a lot of work to do in order to implement wholly, uh, the whole pact. Um, it's foreseen that in around uh, 2026 will be fully implemented. Several criticisms uh, have been raised against the pact. More than 100 NGOs working on the ground, working in the field, at the borders, are against the pact. This is um, a step back in the protection of rights, of migrants' rights, because of the speed-up of procedures that will uh, interfere in the well processing of asylum claims because of the normalization of detention and the, the reinforcement in the end of externalization policies that are also instrumentalizing migration. So 
I think that the pact will influence the, the next uh, European elections in the sense that uh, we have this prediction of a rise of far-right parties that will por probably obstacle the, the implementation of the pact. And now, some words from today's host. As we're nearing the end of the season, I'd like to say a huge thank you to the Alte Schmiede Kunstverein for hosting the talk show many times throughout this year and helping us try our wings in their midst. The Alte Schmiede is an independent, non-profit institution that promotes literature and art and supports artists in realization of non-profit making projects. Quite like us. Thanks Alte Schmiede and a big old thank you to Walter Famler. Will there be a huge backlash after the European elections? That was in your immediate question. Difficult to say. I mean, some of the right-wing populists are outspoken neoliberal, I would say, like in Hungary. The EU externalizing the problem. You're right. Outsourcing problems to neighboring countries who are uh, dependent on the trade and good economic reg uh, regulations. But so one could say there's an asymmetry of power. Uh, which the EU in parts, or a country, especially a nation state like Spain, might um, abuse, you know, m might misuse to regulate migration. Um, however, there is a war going on in Europe, and somebody like uh, Lukashenko or Putin, you know, sending through the Arctic, they are really weaponizing migration, using it as a tool of war. So this is a direct external threat. And so there's a, there's a, a huge dilemma in that. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree that migration is being instrumentalized, but the solution couldn't be the erosion of rights. This is a geopolitical issue. We have to solve it at that scale. Totally agree, especially like one idea behind the pact was like the solidarity between EU, EU member states. But this can be challenging because, first of all, we have a different national interests. We have also economical disparities, tensions between some member states. So that's going to be also like actually an issue. What also civil society organization or uh, and uh, human rights defenders has been also criticizing about this pact is that through this measurement we are letting people to um, choose uh, much more uh, danger routes to come. People who are fleeing a war, they will come anyway. The question is, when we accept such measurements, we accept also that we will have a lot of people dying in the Mediterranean. So we need, I think Europe, we as European, all of us, we need also then to reflect on the questions, what does human rights means for us? And I think it's important to point out that despite the propaganda and how this is sold, especially by the far right, the erosion of rights affects all of us to different levels, but it affects the home population. Yes, I want to say agree. thank you to mm. all. Thanks for coming. This program is presented by Eurozine, an online magazine bringing you reads from more than a hundred partner publications and across dozens of European languages. This is a co-production with the Austrian Okto TV. This talk show is a Display Europe production, a content sharing platform which offers content on politics, culture, community and so much more. It also, miraculously, doesn't abuse your user data. I know, it's a shocker. Now, if you want us to have more of these cute graphics that we run or just like what you see and wish to support our work, please go to patreon.com slash Eurozine. That is Eurozine, the magazine presenting this show. You can pledge as little as five euros a month or whatever you can afford to keep our show going. You'll also get access to bonus materials, invitations to the tapings of the show, and even get to suggest topics and questions. And as we have mentioned, we have a second season coming. So gear up and send us your ideas. This program is co-funded by the Creative Europe program of the European Union and the European Cultural Foundation. Importantly, Views and opinions expressed here are those of the authors and the speakers. They do not necessarily reflect those of the European Union or the European Education and Culture Executive Agency. Neither the European Union nor the EACAA can be held responsible for them. 
I mean, I wish they took advice from us directly, but I guess it's a bit more complicated than that. We also thank dearly the Alte Schmiede Kunstverein for hosting us today and throughout this season. Mm -hmm.